Two desktop environments, both free. One forces you to live in their vision of computing perfection. The other lets you tweak literally everything until you break it. Welcome to the eternal Linux debate. Gnome Shell is the minimalist philosophy major of desktop environments. Clean interface, limited customization out of the box, and an insistence that less is more. It's designed around keyboard shortcuts and virtual desktops, almost daring you to touch your mouse. Meanwhile, KDE Plasma is the Swiss army knife that grew sentient. Traditional Windows-style taskbar, widgets everywhere, and customization options so deep, you'll find yourself changing icon padding at 3 in the morning. Here's where things get interesting. Resource usage tests show KDE using roughly 2,843 megabytes of RAM at idle, while GNOME sits around 2,622 megabytes. That's basically identical. Remember when everyone said XFCE was the lightweight champion? It uses 1,548 megabytes. KDE being lighter than GNOME is not the timeline we expected, but here we are. But GNOME has a secret problem. Moving your mouse cursor can spike CPU usage to 40%, just dragging a window around. Users report GNOME Shell constantly consuming 10-20% to CPU, doing absolutely nothing. Extensions can make this worse. Some system monitor extensions ironically cause performance issues while monitoring performance. Peak chaos. KDE has its own demons. Race conditions can crash applications randomly. Users report the desktop literally disappearing after updates. One person switched to Cinnamon because KDE was acting like a crypto miner on their system. The Plasma 5.0 release was apparently so unstable that people fled in droves. It took years to recover that trust. Then there's the extension nightmare with GNOME. Every major update breaks extensions because there's no stable API. Extensions are literally patches applied to the shell, not proper plugins. Update to GNOME 45? Your workflow dies. Popular extensions maintained by GNOME Foundation members still break. The community has basically accepted this as normal. Some defenders claim this is fine because extensions are too powerful to have stable APIs. That's certainly a take. KDE counters with overwhelming complexity. New users face decision paralysis. Do you want breeze or oxygen? Desktop effects on or off? What about activities versus virtual desktops? The learning curve is vertical. But once you learn it, you can make your desktop do literally anything. GNOME takes the opposite approach. Want to change something? Install GNOME Tweaks. Want more features? Install extensions and pray they survive the next update. Stability-wise, GNOME generally feels more solid. Users report leaving systems running for days with no issues. One person called it stable as a rock. KDE users describe constant freezes, crashes, and memory leaks in certain configurations, but this varies wildly by hardware and distribution. Some KDE users never see crashes. Some GNOME users can't move Windows without stuttering. The accessibility story is completely one-sided. GNOME has screen readers, visual alerts, sound keys, and click assist built in. KDE's screen reader functionality is basically unusable. If you rely on accessibility features, GNOME is your only real option. Here's the verdict. KDE Plasma is for people who want control. Endless customization, traditional workflows, and the freedom to break things spectacularly. GNOME is for people who want stability and simplicity, even if it means living within someone else's vision. Both work. Both have loyal users. The debate will continue until the heat death of the universe. If you're coming from Windows, try KDE. If you want something that just works without tinkering, try GNOME. If you want to argue with strangers online about desktop paradigms, pick either one and join the fun. Desktop environments are personal. Use what makes you productive and ignore everyone telling you you're wrong. Hey, Mark here. So look, I spend a lot of time investigating these products, and honestly, I'd rather not fill this channel with sponsored content from companies whose products I might end up roasting next week. That would be <laughs> awkward. If this review helped you out, 
saved you from wasting money or maybe helped you find something that's actually worth buying, here are a few ways you can support what we're doing here. First up, I've put the link to this specific product down in the description. If you want to check the current price or read more reviews, click through there. And if you do buy through my link, they toss me a few pennies without charging you extra. Win-win. Second option, and this one's for all you regular Amazon shoppers, there's another link down there that just goes to Amazon's homepage. Bookmark it, use it whenever you shop. Doesn't matter if you're buying this product or just restocking on toilet paper. Using that link means a tiny portion of what you're already spending helps fund these investigations. And trust me, Jeff Bezos won't even notice it's missing. <laughs> it's the easiest way to support the channel without spending extra money. Now the third option is for those of you who need help right now. Like, you've got a product sitting in your cart and you're thinking, is this thing legit or am I about to waste my money? That's what our membership is for. Think of it like hiring me as your private BS investigator. For as low as three bucks a month, you submit products for urgent investigation, I do the deep dive and deliver a personalized review to your inbox in 24 to 72 hours, depending on your tier. It's basically like having me on speed dial for product research. Except, instead of calling, you just send me the sketchy product and I'll tell you if it's worth your money or complete garbage. Alright, that's it. Keep questioning everything, and I'll see you in the next investigation, where we figure out what's actually worth your money and what's just expensive garbage with good marketing. Stay savage out there. Catch you next time.